Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. This is a show that investigates the latest marketing technology and makes sense of them for brands and their agencies. It's a series of interviews with interesting people, uh, the first of which is Alex Jenkins, who is the editorial director of Contagious. For those of you that don't know, the way that Contagious describe themselves on their website is that Contagious continues to navigate the complexity of modern marketing. We provide an intelligence platform, briefings, quarterly magazine, advisory service, and live events across the globe to champion brave, innovative creativity across the industry and equip companies to achieve it for themselves. Alex is an excellent public speaker. I have spoken at events with him in the past and every time he has literally wiped the floor with me in front of a room of hundreds of people and it's been an embarrassing experience every time. Um, But we're friends nonetheless. Um, So we're going to talk about Alex's many careers, including writing intelligence reports for the military. We're going to touch on African marketing, how to be a better writer, Lord of the Rings, unicorns and what unites the Terminator and Christmas. And then we'll get on to Alex's shiny new object, which is computational creativity. So I will start that now. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. So hi, Alex. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm good. Uh, I'm in the, the office of Platform 360, uh, where I've been working on my project for the last couple of months. They've been very generous to give me that space for free, although I have fell out with the door staff downstairs <laughs> on a number of occasions. But apart from that, it's all been hunky dory. So, yeah, thanks to those guys. Good uh, sponsored message there. It is, and they're not even paying for that. Uh, maybe that's a maybe that's a thing I should address. Um, you've just got back from Ethiopia. Yeah. Can you talk uh, about that? Uh, not a lot. It was for it was for a client thing, but it was a bit of a an SAS job. It was sort of in stay in a hotel for a very concentrated period of time, <laughs> deliver a presentation to a bunch of African marketers, and then straight back to the airport and leave. So I did not really see Ethiopia. But you told me a couple of weeks back that you were looking for the best of African case studies. Was, is that right? I was. Yeah, we were looking at. What we thought was, yeah, the kind of standout marketing from from sub-Saharan Africa. So I know precisely nothing about marketing in sub-Saharan Africa. What was the cherry on the cake of that um, work? There was, well, there was, there was something which I quite liked. I think there was something which weirdly, uh, like everyone else there really, really, really liked. There was uh, some really interesting work from a beer brand called Tusker in, uh, in Kenya, which did some really interesting stuff on kind of feature phone, kind of mobile. Um, which, to be honest, it'd be quite long-winded to explain exactly how it worked. Oh, go on, give us a... I'm you also... can't come on a podcast and say, I saw a really good thing in Africa, <laughs> but I can't be asked to tell you about it. I'm desperately trying to remember how it went, actually, to be honest. Um, it, was all, it was in the run-up to the Olympic Games um, in 2016. That was when the Olympic Games were, I think. And they were trying to generate uh, a little bit of kind of national pride in Kenya, uh, Tusker is a local sort of beer. And they've kind of got a lot of, um, you know, import stuff coming in, kind of eroding their market share a little bit. And But they, they sort of found that, like, the local attitude in Kenya towards Kenya was a bit kind of meh. People didn't really care that much. Not into Kenya. Yeah, Kenyans okay. weren't that into sort of Kenya. And so they wanted to, uh, you know, try to you know, leverage that a little bit, kind of turn it around, especially in the run-up to the Olympics, get behind kind of Team Kenya. So they set up this service on uh, feature phones where you could just opt in to just get alerts about anything good which was happening in Kenya, just good news kind of alerts. Um, so you opted in for this stuff. Um, so you got little kind of text messages saying, ah, you know, like our bobsleigh team has won. So good stuff about the Olympics. Or um, well, Winter Olympics, given that you said bobsleigh. Well, uh, no, it wasn't bobsleigh. This, that was a terrible <laughs> right. example. Actually, it was nothing to, it was, the news was not to do with the Olympics. It was to do with other stuff. Oh, right, okay. Apart cool. from the Olympics. So I was very jet lagged uh, in Ethiopia. And that's probably repeating right, okay. here on podcast. Um, but they also tied it into uh, a little bit of just kind of a promotional kind of sampling drive. So they would actually send you effectively money to then go out and buy a Tusker beer if you opted in for the service via um, a service called M-Pesa, which yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of telco well, called Safaricom runs. Um, and if the listeners don't know what M-Pesa is, can you just give a... It's like a feature phone um, money transfer service. So if I owed you 
five Kenyan shillings, I could literally just send the, uh, the digit five to your phone and that would just transfer the money to you. Right. So while we're all kind of, you know, patting ourselves on the back, you know, in, in the UK about being able to, like, you know, transfer things via, like, Barclays, ping it and stuff, these guys did it years ago on feature phones. In fact, I think M-Pesa transfers more money just in Kenya than Western uh, Union does across the entire planet. So it's really, really sort of big there. So they tied this kind of good news thing anyway into like this sampling drive, and it had great results, which I can't remember. Right, <laughs> okay. Been put on the spot, and it, I was like, I say, reasonably jet lagged about it. Put but it was, you on the spot. But I it was am sorry. Yeah, but that was my particular favorite one. The thing they all really liked, which is quite weird, which actually wasn't from Africa, which is from Japan, which is weird thing this uh, kind of apparel retailer had done. Uh, it was like a weird sort of Instagram hack. Where they'd on Instagram stories, you know, you get little ads and you swipe up for yeah. more information. So they had these ads for these sneakers, uh, which were in a sale, and they'd artificially put like a hair on the ad. I saw that. Yeah. And it was just. And people just thought it was on the phone, so they swiped up to get rid of the hair, and then it, it took them into the uh, into the the sale ad, which they thought was amazing. They were absolutely loving it. Absolutely loving it. And you think that's not very good, is that? It's not. I think it's very that. good. But I think, you know, you kind of, there's a lot of, you get into like an interesting talk about, um, you know, the, the longevity of the ideas <laughs> like that. The fact that like you make people feel a little bit tricked. You know, it's like, it's probably great if you get the kind of the Instagram equivalent of a click through rate up. But and maybe that's all you need. Like we're having a sale. Uh, you're in. Look, we've got this. Do you want it or not? But it's yeah, not it might not work quite well the second time around. It reminds me a bit of the Carling iPint app. I don't know what. <laughs> the iPint app, yeah. So for those of you who don't know about that, it was one of the first branded apps, very successful, where the app was a, a pint, and then you could yeah. tip it as if you were not mimicking yeah. drinking a pint, and it would kind of glug away down your throat. And you know, I can remember someone showing me that, and me thinking that was incredible. Well, it was it was really early days in like iPhone version one, and it was right at the time when like early adopters were really showing off. Like, look what I can do, and it was just some novelty <laughs> bullshit. But it was actually really. I think it was yeah, it was for calming. I think it was really successful. Um, I might try and download it. If we can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, okay, so I am a. I'm going to just come completely clean here. So I listen to the Tim Ferriss podcast a lot. Have you come across this? Uh, I don't listen to the Tim Ferriss podcast. It, and it's he's like he basically interviews overachievers and kind of asks them why they're so ace and but and he's he's a really kind of odd this is guy. the four hour work week guy. Same guy, yeah. So his, I hear a little bit of gossip that he does a significantly more than four hours a week, actually. Um, well, his podcast is like, <laughs> you're just shy of that some weeks, to be honest. Um, so basically, he reaches out to people that he really likes and then or admires and gets them in and asks them about the kind of tools of the trade. Um, and he has a list of questions that I'm basically going to rip literally off but put a marketing spin on them. Sweet. Um, so if this doesn't work, then... This may never go out, <laughs> um, and it's going to go really serious based compared to the conversation we just had. Um, but we'll rattle through a couple of them, and you can also say uh, no answer or you know don't record this type of stuff. But let's see, let's see how we get on, and then at the end of the episode, we we will touch on a subject I'm super interested in, which is creative artificial intelligence yeah. as your shiny new thing yeah definitely uh, so it'd be really good to for the audience to get to know you a bit better through someone else's questions yeah. um, and then we'll get on to the tech bit um, and then we'll go for a beer so a beautiful triptych of uh, happiness so first question what is the marketing book that you recommend the most often right there is can I talk around this a little bit? Yeah. Okay, so... Like a one-word answer with the name <laughs> of an author would be a bad podcast yeah. answer. June. Franco. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be an odd one. All right, so there's... Because basically the book I recommend probably most isn't actually a marketing book. Um, if I was to recommend like a marketing book, it would probably be like Influence by Robert Cialdini, which is like from back in the 80s. You know, it's sort of a precursor to some of the uh, you know, behavioural economic stuff. Um which, yeah, it's a great book. But I think actually the one, there's, there's two books I recommend a lot, I think. One is um, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by Richard Rimelt, um, which is more of a business thing. Um, but actually right at the top, the book I recommend more than anything else uh, is nothing to do with marketing. It's actually about writing. 
Uh, and it's specifically actually about screenwriting. But I think it's totally applicable to anyone who works in marketing. It's just about good structure and good communications. So it's a book called Invisible Ink by a guy called Brian McDonald, who is like, he's a screenwriter, he's a story consultant, he sort of does, uh, uh, you know, does stuff in kind of graphic novels as well. But he was like, you know, he goes in and, you know, he sort of advises you know, people like, you know, Lucasfilm and Pixar. And I think, you know, Andrew Stanton, the guy who did Finding Nemo, was basically like, look, if, if my next film is a success, it'll be in a large part down to this guy. Um, and it's just a brilliant book. It's very, very short. It's really good fun. It's really, it's an enjoyable read. But it's just about clarity of expression and clarity of communication, actually how you structure a really clear narrative. Um, and you can see, and the reason, I mean, I, I'm kind of at the periphery of marketing, so I'm on the editorial side. You know, so I'm, the team I work with are writers, mostly, so I kind of recommend it to them. But so much marketing kind of fails, or, or not even fails, but falls down on, like, clarity of communication that it's just a lovely book to read to do that and it's it's really like good fun as well like he'll totally convince you in like you know space like one page that the terminator is basically the same film as uh it's a wonderful life and when you read it you go oh my god how did i never see this before he's totally right so if someone who's listening to this for whatever reason can't buy the book or you know doesn't got time or money or whatever what are, what is the kind of key thing that you would someone could take away from it um I think the key theme is just being absolutely crystal clear on the message you want to communicate and then finding kind of creative ways to do it. So to come, which I think is like, you know, advertising comms in a nutshell, like what do you want to communicate? Do it creatively. So, to, you know, to illustrate, you know, the Terminator and It's a Wonderful Life thing, you know, It's a Wonderful Life is kind of, it's writ large, kind of what it is, like, I think my life doesn't matter. You know, it's a guy who thinks that. And then an angel comes down and shows him what his life would be like if he hadn't lived. And it's literally the same in Terminator. Like, there's a point where the Linda Hamilton character, she's a waitress, and I think she says somewhere towards the start, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I could just be wiped off the face of the earth and no one would even notice. Like, it wouldn't matter. I'm such a small cognitive machine. I, my life doesn't matter. And then what actually happens is a Terminator comes and says, which basically proves the point, you're actually not just important. You're possibly the most important person <laughs> because you're the, the mother of the future of the human race. And the whole story kind of like plays that out about how, how important you are as a person. But it comes back to like the kind of the moral, if you will, what Brian McDonald calls the armature, is, you know, you're probably significantly more important than you think you are. And one way is, you know, a very kind of saccharine, you know, kind of Christmas classic. And the other is like a brutal kind of futurist technology, you know, kind of horror sci-fi. Same message. So how does that lesson or that theme they impact the work that you do I think I mean the work that we do obviously is like kind of writing about brands and startups and campaigns but it's just having that clarity of like what are you talking about and then once you're clear on what you're talking about how are you going to structure that argument to make that point to deliver it and communicate it as clearly as possible and as a writer just talk me through the, the blow by blow how that works um, so you go the point of can you, uh, the point I want to communicate is that um, this campaign was great or wasn't very good. And then you go, right, how am I going to argue that? And you do all that at a kind of high level and then you go into the writing detail? I think, I mean, you can do that like that. I mean, you can do um, something what they call a story spine. So, you know, which is like basically any story can be boiled down to probably like about six or seven sentences, you know. So it's, you know, and the classic is, you know, once upon a time there was a fill in the blank. And every day they fill in the blank until one day a thing happened. And because of that, da -da, and because of that, and because of that, and because of that, until finally a thing happened. And then from that day forward, you know, they were just a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser. You know, and you can kind of go literally like the most basic one I can think of is like Incy Wincy Spider. It's like once upon a time there was a spider and every day he went up this damn water spout and until one day the rain came down. And because of that, Incy went down and then blah, blah, blah. Until finally, the sun came out and he went back up again. That, that, that story is literally like six, seven lines. But you take like the most epically long thing, like Lord of the Rings, and you go, <laughs> you know, once upon a time, you know, there was a hobbit called Frodo, and every day he was happy in the Shire, until one day he found out he'd inherited like the one ring of power which would, could destroy his entire earth. 
And because of that, him and his mates had to go off on an extended walking holiday. <laughs> and because of that, you know, he met Gollum. And because of that, you know, they found, you know, Aragorn. And because of that, he actually rose up and became the king. And, you know, until eventually you know, they defeated him and chucked the ring away and, you know, they're all happy. You know, and that's the story. Like, we can't argue that is the story, but it's told out over thousands and thousands of words, but you can condense it down. And so, to get back to what I dimly remember was your question about how it helps, it's... How do you, how do you use that technique specifically in, in your job? Well, I think, I, in theory, you can use it up front. You go, right, the thing I want to say is, you know whatever, like, you know, for marketing, like, creativity is, like, probably our best shot at effectiveness, but there are significant, like, of kind of what we think of as anti-creative forces, which, uh, you know, are going to hamper your ability to get that. And it could be, you know, clients chipping away at the budget, like, kind of creativity by committee, like, knocking off all the bits which are good about it, blah, blah, blah. And in theory, you can kind of structure it and then go in and write it and go in depth. So you can say, all right, creative is our most you know, effective thing. Let's expand on that opening sentence. You know, studies from the IPA, studies from McKinsey, blah, blah. In reality, you tend to have like a bit of a vague sense of what it is you want to say. Like you're kind of like 80, 90% sure of what your key message is. You can often do a bit of research and you kind of start writing and it's, it's a lot messier than that. So I personally use it as a tool to see if I'm writing something that's going wrong, just reduce it right back um, and look at, if you can condense like every page or every paragraph down to like one line, go, what is it, what is it I'm actually saying here? And as an editor, when I look at kind of copy sort of coming in, that's what I do. If, if I'm reading something, it's like it doesn't really make sense. I kind of do that sort of zoom out and go, right, just little line in the margin. What's this paragraph about? What's this one about? What's this one about? And you soon go, all oh, right, they've set up the challenge and they've jumped to the solution. Then they've gone back to the challenge again. And actually when you're reading it in the detail, it doesn't really come through. When you zoom out, you go, right. So it shouldn't go challenge, solution, challenge, solution. It should go challenge, challenge, solution, solution, <laughs> conclusion. Um, so it's, you can kind of use it in different places. I think you'd need to be super, you know, prepared to just have that initial seven sentence, this is what I want to say, you know. Um, but it's a handy thing. So what I'm going to do is stay in, that, in this kind of sort of practical space. So it remind me of the book. Invisible Ink by Brian McDonald. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes. So you'd recommend that to anyone who has writing as part of their job. So what what would be um, what would be the kind of uh, the the thing that the most useful thing that you've bought with your own money that you've used for work? So not something you've expensed like a flight, yeah. Something like that. But <laughs> what what is the thing that you've bought? So maybe like I don't know, like a, a smartwatch or whatever. So you never miss a meeting again. What is the one thing you bought with your own money that's had the biggest impact on your job? I think hands down, without exception, would be a Kindle. Do you, I know some people like don't like these things, but bear in mind, like I'm, I go on a tube every day, and the ability to like read a book without you know, and hold on with another hand, so you don't have to like you know, turn pages. That's quite useful. But I think um, it's like a couple of years ago, I interviewed a professor of machine learning, a guy called Pedro Domingos. He was like very, like he'd been working in this area for like decades. And we, he was talking about, you know, kind of the cortex and artificial kind of intelligence stuff. He said, there's this, there's this notion of like the exocortex, this idea you can just outsource part of your brain. He said, so a notebook is an exocortex. It's like, I'm not going to remember all this, so I'll just write it down. For me, like the Kindle is an exocortex. So I read like a huge amount of stuff on it. And the ability to just highlight passages and to be able to just go, That'll be useful at some point in the future. This quote, uh, you know, about storytelling, I'd have done a better job if I'd had my Kindle there. You know, <laughs> or about you know AI or whatever it is we're looking at. I know I can just go back. I can find the bits I thought would be useful. I can just search through it. Um, it's just an insanely useful thing for me. And how do you choose what to read on your Kindle? Um, I think there's. I mean, I'd, I started. I got a Kindle. I think soon after I joined Conte, so I've been there about eight years now, and you know it's very much, you know, a knowledge business. You know, sort of like to tell the team, look, you're knowledge workers in a knowledge economy. You know, if if we don't know more than the people we're trying to sell stuff to, why would they buy what we've got to tell them? So I sort of like, like literally like a month or two after joining Conte, so I've got this general, you know, sort of permanent fear of just like, God, I've just got to know more than people. I've just got to acquire knowledge like aggressively and continuously. Um, and I think I start off 
uh, looking at like a lot of like behavioural economics stuff, like kind of Dan Ariely and things like that. And then, because I thought that that'd be broadly applicable to any marketing. It's just a framework for looking at you know how marketing is going to work and work on people. Um, and I've been sort of lucky enough to interview people like Dan Ariely and Daniel Kahneman and people like that sort of, uh, you know, over, over the few years. I think in terms of actually like how I select stuff, I honestly don't really know. I think there's sometimes just a bit of like, huh, I, I sort of think like sometimes Amazon recommends a thing. Sometimes like you get a recommendation within a book. Someone says, I know, and you should all check this out. Um, and then a Kate, like very rarely, I just feel like I'll treat myself and just buy a Philip Pullman. But I feel like that almost like an obligation to just constantly be reading work-related stuff. So, so those are the two things you talked about that helped you be more successful. So whether that's a book that helps you write better or an electronic book that kind of outsources storage of information from your brain. So Tim Ferriss would, at this point, go a bit dark and a bit serious, <laughs> and even, um, which I'm struggling with. But anyway, let's do it. Um, what has been your biggest work failure that has set you up for subsequent success? I think <laughs> my biggest failure. My biggest failure is probably like most of my career and like doing like really weird, odd stuff throughout my career. So I've had like I, I mean it's broadly been kind of re- related to writing, I suppose. But, you know, so I've done, uh, like, I was a business journalist for a bit, but I've worked in, like, sort of film production. I was, uh, like, a production coordinator on um, a film called Morven Calla, which produced uh, Lynn Ramsey, director film. She's got the new Whacking Phoenix film coming out. I worked for the military for a bit, like, writing obituaries and doing, like, uh, kind of intelligence report stuff. Um, I worked at the IPA in, like, the knowledge department. Like, kind of, like, really, like, nothing. I worked at a... DM agency briefly doing like copywriting for, uh, for like, you know those leaflets in banks like you should get a mortgage 2.9% APR some, some idiot had to write that I was that idiot um, and kind of like stuttering along and doing things and while also having like this second track kind of like evening career of stuff I wanted to do like trying to be in a band which got like minor success not enough success minor success like publishing a book got minor success not enough success so you kind of stumble your way and and it all kind of like came to a bit of a head at Contagious with like the kind of the creativity of some of the evening stuff and, you know, kind of some of the, the knowledge and the process of just working in different places and seeing like, you know, like working in film production, being right up close to how a film is produced gives you a different perspective when you're there kind of analysing, you know, creativity and marketing campaigns. You know, writing like obituaries for Second World War veterans you know, or like what's happening in uh, in Iraq at like you know sort of post nine eleven, gives you an interesting perspective on you know just you know kind of that spinal tap maybe a bit too much perspective on like just how important ad industry stuff really is. No one's literally died today, so all the stuff which at the time kind of felt a bit disparate and disjointed does feel like it's kind of set me up for this slightly odd role that I've found myself in. So to take that one step further. If you were giving advice to some bright grad, he or she, just out of uni, and they were desperate to get into digital marketing, would you advise them to follow a similar approach? Or I would you give them <laughs> completely different advice? I don't think you could follow that approach if you tried to. Ask. I think like, if you actually try, you couldn't follow that career path, <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd probably be quite deranged if you did. I think um, the thing which... I guess has always struck me and stuck with just, you know, like making opportunities a little bit um, and, you know, just constantly trying to do stuff. I think, you know, I, I'm a, an old enough person to remember kind of the, the, the pre-internet age where if you wanted to write a book and get it published, you couldn't just self-publish on Amazon. You know, you had to go through a gatekeeper and, you know, uh, at a publishing house and someone had to yay or nay it. You know, if you wanted to make a film and actually get it seen by the world, you couldn't just do it, you know, with your phone and stick it up on YouTube. I think the opportunities for people to kind of be creative and do stuff are so great. And just, you know, I suppose if you were to learn anything from my, in inverted commas, career, it would be that, you know, yeah, you can go at it straight on, but you can kind of make your own way a little bit and just keep trying and doing stuff because you'll bring an experience which just other people won't have 
Right. So go into that in a bit more detail. So that that's the key thing for you for a for a grad who wants to get into digital marketing, create experience that no one else has. I think so. I mean, it was intro. We interviewed um, a guy who was doing like an interactive VR thing about a year or two ago. And he'd come from a reasonably sort of traditional production company background. And he was saying, like, this project was mad because it was, um, said, you didn't know which way, they were trying to tell a story in VR and said, we didn't know, like, if someone just turned around and looked the other way, they wouldn't see the moment. So we had to have, like, they said it was the most nightmarish task of storyboarding it. So they showed me the storyboards and it was like, it was insane. It was like almost 3D storyboarding. And, you know, the book I wrote, which I alluded to earlier, was like an, a grown-up choose-your-own-adventure book. I was like, this is exactly what I did. That was precisely like that storyboarding you've done. That's what I did. So, like, the ability to actually talk to these people, go, I know, I know what this feels like, and then to ask questions about it, because you have that knowledge of, like, ah, oh, I can see it. And did you come across, and, like, just a sneaky suspicion, like, did you find this was a... A surprise problem, a surprise opportunity. Went, oh my God, yeah. How would you even know that? So, well, I kind of did something similar like a couple of years back. But it's that kind of breadth of experience, which if you take a very linear path, you know, you, you kind of put yourself up against other people who will also just be very, very comparable. And I think, you know, I think there's like an old Elvis quote about no one ever stood out by looking exactly like anyone else, you know. And if you take a very linear path, you can end up looking a lot like everyone else. You know, and if you take a slightly more left field, bizarre route, you might find it harder, but you will bring something which no one else can bring. You will have that uniqueness. So I'm going to go a bit off piste here and change the tack completely. And I love this question. And I've prepped you on this, so I'm expecting great <laughs> things. Um, if you had a digital media budget of £10 million, to get any message out to anyone, anywhere, on any device, on any media, what would it be? So you could spend that 10 million quid on just taking over the YouTube homepage for, I, I don't know how long, but it could just be Merry Christmas, Mum. But what, so what would it be? What, Do you know what? I, it, what springs to mind is, like, <laughs> just because I'm thinking about it, not because I'm bitter about it in any way, <laughs> this book I wrote, I wrote, wrote it with a lovely guy as well. It was, we co-authored this book, uh, a guy called Steve Morrison. It was a comedy choose your adventure book for grown ups. What was it called? It was called The Regional Accounts Director of Far Top Mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can see, uh, see why this one. And like, we had a proper publishing deal with like, Transworld, which is a big publisher. You know, it does like Dan Brown, does like Terry Pratt, and stuff like that. Um, we sort of somehow managed to like, walk in and just nail like, the first pitch. And right at the point of them publishing it, they pulled all the marketing budget off it and gave it to Girls Aloud. Because. Uh, I think they were about to split and they needed to like get this book out quickly. And so I always felt like this book, which I put a lot of time and effort into and did these bloody 3D storyboards on, no one ever heard of it. I mean, the people who bought it on Amazon, and you should buy it, it's still on Amazon. How much is it? I, I have no idea at all. Right, okay. No idea at all. Someone, um, someone read it recently and sort of sent me like a message going, were you on acid? <laughs> right, okay. Um, but yeah, I never felt that got a fair crack of it. So I'm, I feel uh, I feel like life owes me something. <laughs> so you would blow ten million quid's worth. <laughs> worth now I think me. about it, that is the worst thing to spend money on. <laughs> I just keep it. I'd embezzle it. I would take the money. I'd buy myself a Tesla. There you go. I think you've uh, I think you've said enough. <laughs> um, okay, so um, right. So a few more random uh, Tim Ferriss questions. Um, all right. Slightly more seriously. In the last five years, which new beliefs or behaviours have improved your work life? I think um, if I had to pick one, it'd actually probably be like the ability to reduce stuff and simplify is um, is huge. It's so important. Like the huge isn't the right word. It's like really, really important. It's very powerful. I think when you're when I was younger, anyway, you kind of think you kind of look almost sort of metaphorically above you at people above you and think, it must be so complicated, it must be so complex, it must be wrangling all this crazy stuff. And in a way, they are. But you know, I think the temptation is almost to make things more complicated. Why is that? I see that at work a lot. Um, I remember doing a deck for a brand that should be remain nameless, and I showed it to the account director, and he said, yeah, well, you know, you just need to bulk it out a bit more. <laughs> 
And yeah. I was like, you're, no, he was a group account director, bless him. Uh, and I thought, why on earth would I need to bulk this out? Why do we feel the need to make stuff longer or yeah. more complicated? What What is that solving for us? Because we know that simplicity is a... Yeah, it's well, much more useful and yeah, I mean, I think, beautiful and so I mean, I like it because people can do things with simplicity. But I think you, people do it because certainly when you're a bit young, you think, well, that's, that must be more value. More, like, more slides in a deck has got to be worth more than fewer slides. More words on a page has got to be worth more. You know, and you get it when, um, when we sort of recruit people at Contagious and we do uh, edit tests. And we, we're, we're kind of funny because we're not straight up journalists. Um, we're... It's a very fine slice, but we're more sort of writers, you might say, than, than journalists. Um, and we kind of want people with, like, knowledge, like, ad theory knowledge and stuff like that. So you, you, a straight journal will be great at the writing, but won't know a damn thing about, you know, whatever, like Byron Sharp's theories or whatever. Um, and then you get, like, people maybe from, like, a planning background who are great, but maybe need a bit of hand with uh, the writing stuff, because they haven't done a lot of articles or whatever. Certainly they're not going to churn out, like, ten pages, which doesn't need anyone looking at it. Um, what was the question again? I've slightly derailed myself. Hang on. <laughs> no, no, go on. No, so, the, point, the question was, oh, yeah, that was, um, was like, about, why, why, was do about, we, yeah. why do we exalt uh, verbosity yeah. so much? And I think that the temptation is when people think, I oh, you know, a writer must use like the long words. If you're being paid for it, you've got to use like the fancy words, you know, the, you know, the, the 50 pound words, not the, not, the, <laughs> not the 50 pence words that the rest of us use. And actually it's just, like, you don't want to be reading an article and having to pull out your you know, damn dictionary every two lines going, oh, it's, I, I never really got into like Will Self books. Just one incredibly verbose. <laughs> it's like this is this is, you know, a, a hindrance to understanding. It's not helping at all. But the temptation is you think, wow, I've got to like throw in all these like the big words because that will make me look more pro. I'm mean, more like a professional writer. Um, so that's so we're in gripe mode now, which is good. Um, so what what are the other bad recommendations that you hear in your profession? Along the lines of, we should bulk this presentation up more. Uh, the bad recommendations that we hear. I mean, I don't know. We, I don't know how many recommendations we personally hear. Um, we, I tell, we, our version of like recommendations is we get sent like a lot of work, which people think is great. So uh, this, what case studies from agencies? Case studies, or? like we've done a campaign. We want to write about this. We think we've done something really interesting. And the, the big thing was like we've done a world first. You know, it's like, and people think like the world first is the be all and end all of like doing a good campaign. You know, you could be the first person to, <laughs> I was going to say like shit a unicorn, but all right, let, let, let's maybe not go into that. But being a world first isn't, uh, that was a terrible, terrible analogy. Um, being a world first isn't the be all and end all. And the problem we have is like people often have quite a small kind of, I suppose, like sphere of knowledge in a way of, not of like their industry, but what's gone on in their industry. So say, oh, we've done this world first. You go, yeah, we've seen that seven times before. So I actually saw that. So what's a, so t- give me a bit more detail about that. What, are, what is the classic, we've done this first, but we've seen it before? Oh, I mean, I'm trying to think. Like, the one which springs to mind, which is probably a couple of, like, years old, and it's like, we've done, like, an AR, like, treasure hunt with, like, stuff on mobile. And you go, yeah, seen, done. That's, that's probably not the best. We've probably seen, like, a lot of... That's not even a particularly recent kind of example, but nothing really springs to mind. But you have to like let these people down kind of gently. And go, you yeah, saw that in like Argentina in like two thousand nine. So saw that in like, Brian, like wherever. Yeah, we have this thing in agencies, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of other agencies that you get different ideas in brainstorms or, or from creatives that come back all the time. So the Spotify playlist has ruled supreme <laughs> for about five years. I think every pitch that I worked on for like four years doing new business was like, oh, we're pitching for uh, Pizza Hut. How about like a Pizza Hut Spotify playlist? Yeah, the thing at the moment, I've been involved in, um, we sort of get brought in because we're neither an agency nor a client, so we're the independent, like, yeah, we should do, you know, maybe you should have a look at this. We've got no skin in that game. If we think you should do something in AR, it's because we think you should, not because we're going to do it for you. So we get brought into like, you know, kind of hackathons and like innovation brainstorms and kind of agitate and just like show some cool stuff. And is that a product that you sell? Do you hire us to come in and yeah, be contagious? Exactly, okay. Yeah. And um, and the thing which like like so far in the last year I've heard like four times in four different sort of sessions, is we could do a Netflix documentary about our product, basically. And just trying to or like or, or this issue. 
and you know, there was one group I was like sort of trying to talk to them and I was like yeah I can see why you'd, you why you would want that <laughs> of but course. I was like but I can guarantee like you know documentaries are maybe not the best way to kind of educate or raise awareness about the thing I was like I can guarantee more people learned about Dunkirk from the Chris Nolan film than a documentary about it there's probably more people know about Titanic from the James Cameron film than a documentary the list of these films go on and on about it's like have you not thought about entertainment but they're all fixated on this damn Netflix documentary documentary. like that is like turnkey solution to all their problems I think in years gone by it was flash mobs that was flash mobs it was almost like a little bell that would go off in the the brainstorm session where we could do a flash mob like T-Mobile and then we'll do a viral we'll do a viral off the back (laughs) of it come on let's do us a viral song (laughs) so your uh, so your shiny new object technology is viral videos (laughs) (laughs) and flash mobs (laughs) yeah flash mobs uh, playlists um, so thanks for all those questions. I'm sorry they're a bit weird, but no, that was no, I was really interested in all the, the books, including your own. I'll put in the show notes. <laughs> so um, yeah. Yeah, put mine at the top. I will. I will. Uh, uh, I will lead with that. Um, so in terms of the shiny new object, obviously the promise of this podcast is that we'll talk about a new bit of marketing technology that people are getting super excited mm. about. Um, so. Uh, as an innovation director, you're kind of peddling this stuff, right? It's yeah. your job to be able to say before everyone else, look at this thing, a chatbot, no one's ever seen this before, and everyone's, oh my God, and then you sell that into the client. Yeah. And as an innovation director, you have to Although be... I'm not an innovation director. I'm talk, yeah, that's, yeah, that's oh, sorry, yeah. talking about myself. Um, you have to be super optimistic about the potential of every bit of technology. So what I really wanted to do with this podcast is to kind of sit on the other side of the fence and try and understand someone else's view of a new technology from a kind of sceptical yeah. kind of client or account manager perspective. So your shiny new object is computational creativity. It is, yeah. So can you start off and explain what that is? Yeah, it's the ability... This is going to sound like I'm taking the piss out of you. It's the ability for computers to be creative. But I think you can break that down into, I guess, a couple of areas. There's like generative stuff where they're actually generating their own kind of creative work there is kind of evaluation um, where they're evaluating creative work and oh, what's the third one maybe I'll just say there's two hang on it will come back it will come back um, so this is computers making art yeah to, yeah. well yeah they're so, make, making making advertising that's not that's not <laughs> open promise <laughs> Well, there's a whole community around computational creativity. That's a there's a huge number of people in academia yeah. using machines to generate art. Yeah. But I guess, well, where does where does art stop and advertising take over? Yeah, Is yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sort of the, the bit I was when I said that was my shiny object was was the, the ad bit of it. But yeah, there's they've been doing this for decades, and decades doing it in like art and like games and music and. All kinds of, but I think really like the academic end was very much, you know, like kind of we're doing it because we can. We're exploring this area, but no great kind of commercial um, purpose to it. But some really like interesting and crazy stuff going on out there. I saw like an amazing example of someone who built it was like a who done it kind of murder mystery thing based on Wikipedia articles and the kind of hierarchy of links between them. So you choose a person. So say you choose Justin Bieber, you'd say Justin Bieber's been murdered. Who's murdered him? And we'll make a game out of it and go, well, he was, you know, and based on Wikipedia links, go, well, he, you know, he came like number two in like that week's, you know, charts against Taylor Swift. So Taylor Swift's a suspect. But then there could be like a local Canadian kind of pop star. I said, well, Bieber's Canadian as well. So they become a suspect. And like, you know, his, like, but it was, some of it like could even go dark. It's like, well, he was like first propelled to fame by his mother. So his mum's a suspect as well. <laughs> but there's no real, um, you know, kind of commercial output beyond. Let's just see if computers can do this stuff. So, computational creativity sounds very interesting, and that Bieber link I've seen, and I can imagine mm. that getting passed around someone in a brand. But I, I am the CMO of Boots, and so I see that article, and I'm, what has that got to do with me as a yeah. marketing person? Well, I think this one. Like ignore, I said three, ignore that. There's two. There's two <laughs> bits, right? There's generation of creativity and there's evaluation of creativity. I think at the generation end of things, from what I have seen, I think it's still kind of in the novelty phase. 
almost. It's like you can do stuff, and it's it's kind of all right. But it's and when you could be specific about what you mean by generation, I, I know what that means. Okay, We've so talked about this before, but say you're complete, you're the marketing director of Boot, and you've got no idea what okay, generation so of content. So we're talking. Let's yeah. Let's, so let's think about you know like traditional ad, like a TV ad. You could get a computer to generate you a script. You could get it to generate, uh, you know, visuals, generate soundtrack, generate the audio, edit it, like the whole whole nine yards. And individually, there's technologies which will do all of those things. And some of them are more advanced than others. I think, like on the music side of things, um, you know, there's some actually genuinely quite credible and good music being generated by AI. On the script side of stuff and kind of the narrative end of things. Like it's, there's some comedy examples out there. I mean, they're not intended to be comedy, but they're funny because they're they're not kind of right. Um, and the same with like the visuals. Like you know, it's like they can generate some stuff, but it, there's always it's kind of uncanny valley kind of stuff. So I think in terms of generation, the idea of like I'll press a button on my computer and pow, a TV ad will come out the other end. We're not there, but the pieces are in place for that to almost be an, in, an inevitability, I think. The thing I think which is more pressing, more ready today is like the evaluation stuff, the ability to, you know, kind of look at certain types of creative and go, this will be more effective than another type. Uh, so so who, who's doing that? Um, so, I mean, on the... Again, I'm sort of talking on the, you know, let's think of it as the lower down the ladder of kind of marketing com stuff. Okay. Um, so like email marketing things, you know, there's companies like Posado and Frazy, which will generate emails and for you. And I think like Posado claims it can write copy, which will be more engaging, more effective than any human could write copy for you, but only in certain sectors. So I think it's just in like retail, just in financial sort of com stuff like that. Um, and they base it on, you know, emotions and things like this. And they'll do huge amounts of like, testing and feedback and optimization, and they'll create you an email which you can send out um, and then there's on the more visual side there's companies like I know you know like Picasso Labs yeah um, which will take like any of a brand's visual assets like their you know sort of photos but also videos as well and just analyze it and tell you what will work what will work better and they spoke at your event most contagious they did yeah um, so really interesting, really interesting. The, um, and, and it's kind of important, like we interview a lot of people in this sort of space and they all of them, and they, maybe you say, well, they would say this, but all of them kind of to a man or a woman will say, you know, we're not trying to replace creative directors. What we're trying to do is augment them and give them kind of the data and the proof to show that they're correct in a way. Um, but Picasso Labs is like, it's really interesting because I look at like, you know, all of your visual assets, but also look at all your competitors' ones that's kind of scraped off the internet or whatever, and tell you what they think will work for you based on, you know, someone else. And, um, you know, we asked them, do you, th- you know, surely if you're, is this just a race for everyone to end up looking exactly the same? And they said they'd tested it, I think, on two airlines. They put in, like, British Airways and Virgin uh, Airlines. And actually recommended totally different things based on what the brand was all about, what they wanted to achieve, you know, kind of, you know, how they were perceived, how they wanted to be perceived. So you don't get this, oh, well, the computer says you should all have, you know, smiling stewardesses and this kind of thing. And did she do the game on stage? Um, I, don't, I don't even know if she did do the game, actually. Because um, um, I know Anastasia very well, and um, Noah, one of her colleagues, came to speak at my event, I'll be mm. back with every yeah. month. We get people together to discuss the intersection of uh, uh, AI, creativity, and ads. And Noah came down and presented, and he was brilliant. And he said, well, we use this technology to work out which images work best. Yeah. So he did a quiz. So he said, right, in, in a room of 60 people that came down, which of these three photos of a car do you think drives mm. the most engagement, you know, from behind, from the side or in front? And... I think out of five different examples, the audience only got it right once. Amazing. So you have this idea in your head that, you know, I work in advertising, I've, I've been around this for 10 odd years, yeah. I know what's going on here. And, you know, your instinct is quite often wrong, certainly in the, a room of 60 people. Yeah. The, the median was, was definitely wrong most yeah. times. And that's something I to your point, like if you are like a <clears throat> marketing manager at Boots or somewhere, the idea that you could just be right 
is like very reassuring. And it's like, well, I could go with my gut, or I could go with like what the agency saying, or you know, bugger it, we'll just ask the computer, and the computer is right, you know. And if it's wrong, it'll just optimize and make it right. You know, when you've got so much other uncertainty, you know, in your job, and you're trying to do so many other things, just like something you can just like grab onto and go, well, that'll be right. It's very attractive, I imagine. And what kind of pushback are you hearing about computational creativity? So it's, that's interesting. I did... Um, well, I've, I've talked about this. I've given talks about this a fair bit, like with quite a few Q&As over the last you know, 12 or 18 months or so. And there's a real oil and water split in terms of age group, I think. There are the... You get above a certain age... And this is like being very, very like broad. I don't want to be like you know, ageist about this. But this was my experience of it was people get above a certain age and they just deny it. They just refuse, like, this, this technology does not exist. Even when you show it to me, it does not exist. Even when you've, it's been proven, I do not believe it will do what it do. Because, and, you know, there's an element of, you know, I've got a couple of years left in my career. You know, I'm, I'm going to retire soon. I don't really care, but I, this is not the narrative that I want to hear right now. I don't want to add to this. Um, and sort of the, you know, the way I tend to, like, if I'm talking about it, it's like sort of sum up as like, you know, you guys aren't going to lose your job to a computer. You'll probably lose it to a human that's better at working with a computer than you are. Someone who can actually kind of wrangle these systems. Um, and my advice is generally like, bring it in, like use it now, be the person who knows how to use this stuff. Don't be that kind of like person a couple of years down the line who just denies it, denies it. And then suddenly finds that, you know, they've been optimized out of a job almost. And the problem is, like, the people at the top who are sort of denying it. And going, I, I don't want this to be true, but I have the clout at our agency to bring this in, but I'm going to cut, like, that off. I'm going to, like, you know, you know, cut our neck off on that one. So the younger generation coming up is not getting an opportunity to get their hands on this stuff. And so let's talk about a couple of scenarios. So five years from now, computational creativity doesn't work, works a bit, or works incredibly well. Talk me through what happens in each of those scenarios. I think, I mean, I'm going to kind of like, you know, say it doesn't work. I'm going to discount that because I think we've seen that and it is working in areas. So at a really low level, maybe not even a really low level, but at, at a certain level, it, it is working a bit. I think it, it may just never progress beyond a certain point. So like, you know, looking at, so, you know, what image should I put up on my Instagram feed, which will get most likes? Fine. Outsource that. Compute says yes, says no to the other four. Uh, we go with that. Um, if it's, you know, and it may just kind of take up that kind of like the day-to-day volume of, you know, let's be blunt about it, kind of filler advertising. The stuff's like, shit, we've got, a, we've got a social channel we've just got to keep. There's just a volume of stuff we've just got to keep putting out there. Um, Fine, we'll do that. Oh, we've got to do some like banners and some email marketing. Fine, let the computer do it. No one really wants to work on it. I think the problem there is that's that's like a thin end of the wedge. And if the computer gets better and it starts leveling up and leveling up and taking on more stuff, I think that's the big unknown. There's a really interesting, um, you know, people always underestimate, uh, you know, how good things are going to get. This there's a really interesting recent example. I don't know if you saw it about the deep fake thing that's going on. Deep fakes. So it's something which started on Reddit. Basically, this guy developed this uh, algorithm, and it's being used to put uh, the faces of celebrities onto porn stars in films. Like not like a not just like a sort of Photoshop job. Actually, like you get a porn film, and it's got what's name like Daisy Ridley from Star Wars or Gal Gadot from you know, Wonder Woman, and. And it's them, and it looks exactly like them, or very, very, very like them. Like the voices and things are all off because they're not doing that. Um, and and so it's using the same type of technology. Which do you remember in um, the end of that Star Wars film, Rogue One, when young Princess Leia comes in, mm. they've kind of brought her back from the dead. It's kind of using that stuff. Whereas Hollywood spent like millions on the CGI budget to do that. Basically, a couple of people have just like written this algorithm, it's, it's machine learning, so it teaches itself how to do it, it gets better and better, and it's free, and it's just on the internet. So there's this ridiculous subreddit um, called Deepfake or Deep Fakes. And this guy was there sort of posting up, and so you need a couple of things to do it. One, you need 
where you don't need a porn film, you just need a film, basically. It doesn't have to be porn, but it's all porn, Tom, it's all porn. Then you need, um, in order for it, like, the face to kind of map to the other face, you need, like, hundreds of photos of the celebrity or other person you want to put on it, which is why it works with celebrities, because there's just hundreds of photos of them that are available on the internet. Um, and then it kind of maps them on in 3D and it tracks it around. And what's weird is, like, so this thing got, like, good crazy quick because of the speed of AI just working on it. You know, people always underestimate how good this stuff's going to get and how quickly it's, it's going to get. Um, and, and the subreddit is so weird because it, it became a shopping list. This guy was like, hey, I've done this and I've done, like, and it, I think the original one was, like, it was literally, like, Daisy Ridley, you know, uh, on the, you know, in a porn film. And... And then people just said, right, I want, uh, this is the person I want. I want this person. Do this person. Do this person for me. And they're just like putting in requests, like a shopping list of celebrities they would like to see in porn films. And so you can download this app called the Deep Fake app. And then people were uploading these like very realistic fake celeb porn films onto Pornhub. So like in the last like couple of weeks, a lot of these like big you know, kind of internet porn providers have banned it. So they're now like saying that this is a step too far. Even for the porn industry, it's a step too far that we won't allow computer generated fake porn. And they've taken it all off. I was not expecting to hear uh, those words. I mean, I, um, <laughs> yeah. um, okay, wow. Well, so um, sorry, I mean, guess so, the point so, I was so, making yeah, was well, yeah, you know, crap, reasonable, good, good. So the point with the deep fake thing was it got good so much quicker than anyone thought you know and it's not that I encourage people to go looking at porn if you search for it on the internet like you can see gifs so you don't have to go watching porn you can just see gifs of this person's face just on a on a clothed actress yeah um, and you're like that's totally and like, so know, in a marketing context the marketing director of Boots might go right well um, what we can't afford this actress or actor for a whole day um, but they've given us license to use their face, so yeah. we'll use the body of someone else to get, you know, yeah. an out of work actor working for seventy five quid a day to do multiple takes, and then we'll yeah. transpose or deep fake their face yeah, onto yeah. it. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so that's you can go. Do you know what? We want Morgan Freeman. We can't afford Morgan Freeman. Let's get some of the same body kind of size and shape, and we'll just film this out, and then we'll just stick his face on it. Like, where's the law on this? And then. I mean, you must have heard, like, you know, the, this kind of the voice generation stuff. There's, you know, startups like Liarbird. And, yeah, and so much. yeah. Where you can literally just type in text and it comes out in the voice of the person you want. I think Liarbird claim they need 30 seconds of sample of... 30 seconds of sample of someone speaking to just replicate that voice. And so, you know, you've got Morgan Freeman for free using his likeness. It's where, And at the moment, like, it's, it's not particularly ethical, but... The law has not caught up with that yet. Well, he, he could equally sell that as a package, though, couldn't he? Yeah. He could go, well, here's my voice print, and yeah. you can, I'll say whatever you want. I won't say these words. You can't get me on these topics. Yeah. So he will have his own like parameter in AI that allows yeah. him to speak. I, I, um, I was listening to the, the Flash Forward podcast. Have you heard this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and she was saying that there was this kind of future where Tom Cruise might, after he dies, have already sold his his visual and audio rights so they can yeah. carry on making more Mission Impossible films. God help us. But, no. but uh, you know, some stunt guy comes in and represents him and they just keep on making more and more of these films, which means that someone could be more successful as an actor mm. uh, after they die. Um, but I don't know if you saw the example from uh, Microsoft, I think it was at the start of January. They've, they've created a tool where you can type in yellow bird with a short beak and it will create a photo real image of a, you know, a chaffinch with a, yeah, with a beak amazing. and you can see it sort of chop it together so I'm, not, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time experimenting and thinking about this space um, in, the, in a, you know, the, the sort of Pasado end of it but really yes you're absolutely right there's technology there that can produce cinema fundamentally yeah. so if you can chop together an advert like on a you know, in a browser, then yeah. why, and, why is a brand going to spend Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's not... Money? It's incredibly fast. It's going to get incredibly good. And it's crazy cheap as well. That's the point. Like, this guy on, like, Reddit doesn't have, like, the budget of Lucasfilm behind him. It's like a guy probably with, like, a Dell desktop. Maybe he's got something a bit better. But, but you know, like, the, the barrier to entry on this stuff is just so low, you know, because a lot, so much, like, the processing can be outsourced to the cloud... You know, like I say, it's just a browser. It's kind of all you need. 
it's that's you know the almost the event horizon we can't see beyond is like so when it's almost to the point of being free it's insane like it's going to get very high quality and it's cheap so we can do anything you know it's you kind of, that's when you kind of want it. and it's I know you've had like a bit of a musical background as well but it reminds me a bit of you know sometimes creative limitation is a good thing so like you know when the Beatles recorded Abbey Road they had a four track recorder in fairness they also had Abbey Road and George <laughs> Martin and they were the Beatles but they had a four track recorder now you know you can probably get like free you know music recording software just download it and it has infinite tracks you can record as much as you want you can sample you get free drums anything you want the music being produced is not noticeably better than the Beatles. Now we have infinite creative freedom. I think, in a way, that's going to be the challenge. It's when you can do anything, what the hell do you do? Alex, I'm going to leave it there. If you can do anything, <laughs> what the hell do you do? Probably uh, so- not promote your <laughs> crappy book. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so thanks for telling us about um, Ethiopia and uh, the hottest <laughs> digital marketing campaigns of Sub-Saharan Africa, of which I knew nothing. Uh, you told us about uh, your favourite book, which I'll link to, uh, and you know how important to you the you know the value of of, of writing is, uh, and your interest in career, and how you you know you'd recommend someone to go out and get new experience so that they're not comparable to the person who's just going through the process of a, maybe a big agency, um, and. I've absolutely loved hearing your your view and computational creativity, and you've opened my mind again to the idea that actually we're going to blow right past direct response adverts into kind of full blown ads yeah. uh, quicker than we think. And the porn. Sorry <laughs> about the porn, but you know, um, it does so, tend to drive uh, drive a lot of innovation so, in that industry. <laughs> so as. Uh, uh, Tim, who is the inspiration for this show, Tim Ferriss would say, how can people get in touch with you or reach out or where do they find you online? Um, like you can contagious.com for work. On Twitter, I'm just A underscore J. That's a good one. Good yeah, I was, I was a pretty early adopter on Twitter. Uh, cool. All right. Well, thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks for having me.